Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Alison McConnell and Tam McManus here with us today uh, to look back over the weekend's football, look ahead to Wednesdays in the Scottish Premiership. And we'll touch on some of the events down south in the English Premier League as well. You can follow us, you can share our stream, and we'd love you to do that. We'd be very appreciative of that fact. Uh, and also, if you've got the YouTube, why not hit the subscribe button on there as well and join our football family. So, lots to talk about. We'll read out a few of your messages as well. Um, but yesterday, it was the it was the late, late show. We'll talk about uh, Hamilton Rangers. We'll hear from Stephen Gerrard. We'll hear from Neil Lennon, Jack Ross, and Derek McInnes as well. Um, first and foremost, though, the uh, news coming out today, Tommy Wright is the new Kilmarnock manager, and here's a wee bit of background from our reporter, Gabriel Antoniazzi. Tommy Wright has been appointed as the new Kilmarnock manager on a contract until 2023, replacing Alex Dyer. The 57-year-old has been out of a job since parting ways with St Johnston, despite links to vacant roles with his native Northern Ireland and Motherwell. Wright was in charge for the Perth side for seven years, having previously managed three clubs in his homeland. He won 126 of 309 games at a rate of 41%, and he was voted the manager of the season for the 2015-16 campaign after leading his side to one of their three fourth-place finishes and then into Europe. Wright also took the Saints to their first and only major trophy as they beat Dundee United 2-0 in the 2014 Scottish Cup final at Celtic Park. Wright's initial task will be to secure the immediate safety of Killy, who are 10th, just four points above the drop. But long term, he'll have his sights set much higher. What do you make of that appointment, Ruffy? Yeah, we discussed on Friday that a lot of clubs looked as if they were going to go for younger uh, guys coming up. Uh, but this time, obviously, they've had a couple of guys who haven't had any experience at all as being the number one. Uh, so they've decided they've, they're going to go for that experience, and quite rightly so. I think we all thought that Tommy Wright had a chance of getting the Motherwell job. But uh, I think the owners, obviously, in Kilmarnock have decided and they've looked at what they've done and the position that they're in just now, he's the right man for the job uh, to get them out of where they are. Yeah, here's what uh, Billy Bowie had to say about his appointment. Um, we believe Tommy is the right candidate to lead us up the Premiership table in the season's remaining games while sharing our vision, of course, for the club's future. He is an outstanding manager with a strong track record in this league of improving players whilst remaining committed to blooding young talent through the ranks. I'm sure our supporters will join me in welcoming Tommy to Kelly and wishing him every success in his time at Rugby Park. And I'm... I'm Picking up on Ruffy's point here, um, Alison, which is quite simply experience. Um, I think that's what you need at the bottom end when you're thinking about trying to fend off relegation or possible playoff places. First and foremost, I think it's a, a stable appointment. I think he he brings great experience, of, as you have said, and he also has a, a background of working within a budget of, of getting the best out of players. But he knows the landscape, he knows the league, he knows the players. Nothing here is, is new to him. There, there's no novelty involved. So I think you would back him to come in and just steady the ship. And, and this season will be all about keeping them in the league. But longer term, I think Kilmarnock as, as a club have a, a good, strong infrastructure. You saw what happened when, when Steve Clark was there and, and how he elevated them straight up towards that top three spot. And I think Tommy Knight will be looking to do likewise. I don't know about following quite in the same steps, but I think he would fancy that he could keep them as a top six club. Here's what Tommy Wright had to say about his appointment. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be the new Kilmarnock manager. It's a great opportunity for me and is the perfect time for me to come back to management. Kilmarnock has had good success in recent years and I'm looking to take it forward and moving us up the table. This is a really good football club with good people and I was really impressed uh, when speaking to them, which made it an easy decision to take the job. And of course, we were all at this point, Tom McManus, looking at it and thinking, I wonder why Tommy Wright's uh, not in a job um, but he wasn't in the job um, it's been such a delay but suddenly Tommy Wright you know has waited and this is the perfect idea chance for him to get back into it yeah as listen I think that we were all surprised that Tommy Wright never got the Motherwell job I thought he was a, an outstanding candidate for that gig uh, 
I think that Kamala need a safe pair of hands. You know, they're, they're in a precarious position at the bottom. You know, they're, they're dropping like a stone down the league. You know, they're, they're, and you see Hamilton yesterday picking up points. He's going to scrap away in Ross County. So I think it was really important that Ross County, eh, Kamala got a, a top manager in and be good Scot eh, Scottish experience. And they've got that in Tommy Wright. And I think that he will do very well there. He's, it's a similar size club to St. Johnson. You know, similar budget as Alison was saying. And I think he'll get them up the table fairly quickly. Yeah, um, so that's the main news on uh, Kilmarnock appointing Tommy Wright elsewhere. Usually we get a bit of breaking news and that might come before we finish today on the Albion Ayeti uh, appeal against that too much ban for diving. It's difficult to say which way that will go, Ruffy, because they always seem to come up with some technical issue on it or a, a good legal team that can argue the case. Yeah, and there's lots of times you're shaking your head saying, how did that happen? You know, but in this instance, I think uh, I can appreciate why it might happen. They might get off with it because of the slight contact. Uh, and I think that's the word that everybody uses when they ever go into their meetings. Was there contact or not contact? I think there was slight contact, but not for him to go down the way he, he went down. And as I said, I, I watched the video uh, numerous times and he actually does trip himself up eventually as he's fallen to the ground. So... Uh, I would give him a two a two match ban, but I, I've got a funny feeling they'll go off with it. Yeah, OK. Um, we'll wait to see if that uh, transpires. Uh, yesterday, uh, I mentioned that it was a late, late show between Hamilton and Rangers. Uh, I looked at the the game and as it was getting to the end, I thought, OK, maybe 30 seconds to go here. Uh, looks as if uh, Rangers are going to see it out, just a solitary goal, which they've been doing on a regular basis, uh, Ali. And then... Um, Suddenly, you know, a late equaliser, very late. I thought Alan McGregor had actually kept, I thought he'd probably win them the game. I thought he'd a couple of really good saves, particularly in the second half. And then and then all of a sudden, I didn't see it coming at all. I think, as you say, Rangers have ground out these kind of results, particularly over the last month or so. A goal here and a goal there and, and just seeing it out and just making sure you're picking up the points. But... You could sense just how frustrated Stephen Gerrard was. Not not just he was after the game, not just with the, the result and dropping two points, which in the grand scheme of things, let's be honest, I'm not sure there's any real significance in it. But I think he was irked just at the manner of the performance. It was very lackadaisical. It was very pedestrian. It lacked the creativity, the urgency that we've seen in Rangers for the bulk of this season. In fact, you know, on Friday, Brian Rice was complimenting them on, on the hunger that they've shown throughout this campaign and, and it seemed to be absent and it just shows you what happens when you take two or three players out of the team that have been fundamental to the way that you've played over the course of the campaign when you take them out how it just affects people round about you um, but I, I think it, his real frustration won't be the fact that there were points dropped because I, I don't think it matters I think it's insignificant now but he'll have been irked just at the, the way they played over the, the course of the full 90 minutes because I think Hamilton were worthy of the point yeah, here's how Steven Gerrard summed it up. Yeah, that's the easy way out to say it's a bad day at the office. You know, we had one of them at St Mirren, that's the reason why we can't win a League Cup. Um, today was worse. Uh, I thought that was our worst performance of the season. Individual performances today weren't good enough. Um, our keeper's been the busiest out of both goalies and kept us in the game. And is the reason why we're taking the points away from the game. It would have been a smash and grab from us. Um, so, look, we, we, we got what we deserved. We could have got worse. Well, the other thing about it, Tom, as well, is Rangers have, and in contrast to last season, Rangers in four of the last seven games have won by a solitary goal. So that's that's the, been the key to their success. It was a slip-up yesterday. But as Ali mentioned, you know, uh, the only thing that changed was bringing on Davis and Jack, you know, changed the momentum and the impetus to try and get out of this neutral gear they were in. Yeah, definitely. I think that obviously Rangers were, were poor. Yes, there's no, no denying that. Um, I think that from the very start of the game, Hamilton looked as if they were going to have, have a go. And we spoke about it on, on Friday that Brian Rice would, would set his team out to have a go. And he certainly did that. And I, I just felt like Rangers went through the motions for a lot of the game. But as you say, Ryan Jack, Steve Davis on the bench. you know, And, and Stephen Gerrard spoke about it as well. You can't you can't play these guys every game, particularly Steve Davis. You know, you, if you can't play him every game. You've got to rest him now and again and, and go into your squad. And the guys that come in have got to be good enough to go and get three points at Hamilton Ackies, to be honest. So, you know, Stephen Gerrard will be raging about the performance. But as Alison said, listen, I don't think it makes a, a, a great deal of a difference in terms of the title race. Rangers are still going to win the league. But 
it's a little warning across their bows that they can't afford to drop the levels if they want to go in the, and win the league as early as possible. Yeah, and a positive sense for uh, Hamilton Ackies. Uh, when we get to the business end of the season, every point might count. And Brian Rice delighted with the one he got yesterday. From my point of view, and from my team's point of view, I think uh, points at least we deserved it in the match for our, our bravery, the way we played, uh, some of our stuff that we played, and for the commitment the boys showed, I think our points at least we deserved. We had a couple of games in hand, Ruffy. Um, there was only three points between them and Ross County. Um, they had a high press yesterday. They tried to force Rangers into mistakes, and and they got that belief. I thought it was, you know, it's unusual for Alan McGregor to to release the ball out from the from the Anderson shot, but Hamilton, you know, took full advantage of it. Yeah, I think you have to give uh, Brian a lot of credit. You know, he obviously had a game plan, uh, obviously to stop the major players in the Rangers team, uh, and that's what he did. Uh, th th there wasn't enough of them. I think Ryan Kent had a couple of a couple of chances, but apart from that, everybody else was, was quite quiet. So he, you're right, he would have been extremely disappointed if he'd have lost that game, won nothing, and they deserved what they got out of it. And he'll be hoping that his players now can look at these two games that you're talking about uh, and taking points for that, because there are some teams there just above them who must be feeling the pressure at this precise moment in time. Yeah, um, on Saturday I was at Celtic Park to watch Celtic against Motherwell. It was a narrow win, but it was a win nonetheless. And uh, Neil Lennon seemed well happy with it. And of course, he was very complimentary about the way his team played. I thought we looked a really good team. You know, I thought we looked, you know, some of the football that we played first half and even in the second half, you know, was some of the best football of the season. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of good signs there. Okay, um, Ali, uh, you know what I think of, uh, you know, some managers sometimes paint pictures uh, that just ain't there. Um, I certainly didn't think it was the best football of the season. They got the job done in the end. Yeah, I thought it was a very comfortable opening half for them, but t towards the, the end, they're, they're kind of hanging on. You, you sense the fragility when Celtic lose a goal and, and the points are in question. You can, you can just feel the, the nervousness, I think, that goes through the team defensively. Uh, I think there's still quite a bit of work to do. I think it's now just a case of trying to limp on between now and the end of the season. And I think the time has gone even to, to put any significant pressure under Rangers. I think when you look at the gap at the top, even if Celtic go now and, and win their, their two games in hand, you'd still be looking at a 15-point gap or so, I think. Uh, I, I just think you're almost playing for pride at Celtic to see out the remainder of the campaign. And and you just hope that they can they can muddle through between now and the end of the season and at least make it keep keep it exciting. Uh, I suppose in in some ways in that uh, they they'll keep up the hunt for the the second spot. But you just feel that Celtic season could have gone into freefall. I think. Yeah, um, Tam draws have killed Celtic, and that's the back line. Yeah, definitely. I think the you know the recent draws, particularly against Hibs, you know when there are a lot of players missing after just coming back from Dubai. You know, games like that you've got to be winning. Livingston away from home, you know, two each. So those are the games that Rangers have been winning this season. And that's why they're so far clear at the top. You know, and as you said, they've been grinding out results. And Celtic have not been able to do that. You know, and, um, you know, Celtic back-to-back -back wins. You know, we've not seen that many times this season. So, listen, I think the league's all long gone. But it's up, to, it's up to Neil Lennon now. He's obviously got a new guy come in and charge at Celtic. He's got to try and impress him. Um, if he's got any sort of opportunity, he'd be the manager next season, which... I don't think it's going to happen, but if he wins every game for now at the end of the season, he might give himself a small chance of being the manager next year. But um, as, as Ali said, it's all about pride for Celtic now. They've just got to keep trying to win every game and, uh, and hope somewhere that, that Rangers slip up, but I don't see it at all. Mm, the one shining light from the weekend, it was an early goal for Stephen Welsh and maybe a chance for him to get a run as a centre-half. The boy clearly delighted to get that first ever goal for Celtic. Hi, it's a great moment. Uh... You know, one that I've probably been waiting for is a great ball for, for Dave. You know, he does that week in, week out. And, uh, you know, my job is just to get on the end of it, and thankfully I did. Well, he scored the goal, Ruffy, but uh, I watched a, a rather, I wouldn't say lone figure, because he just goes and trains with the substitutes. Um, but Shane Duffy on the sideline with Stephen Welsh uh, in the team tells you all you need to know. Uh, about Celtic accepting the fact that it just hasn't worked out with Duffy. And I don't expect to see too many games where he'll be in that back line unless there's a major injury. 
No, I think you're right. I think we all, we're all scratching our heads how this hasn't worked. You know, we've obviously seen the credentials of him as a, a club player and an international player more than anything else. And uh, I, I can't remember him having any particular game that he was a standout. Uh, but as, as Alison was saying there on Saturday, it was the same old story, you know, 2 nothing coasting, uh, having loads and loads of chances, and all of a sudden a goal goes in. And uh, it's, it's the same old story for some of the the, the the younger members out there who watched Dad's Army. It was a case of don't panic, Mr. Mannering. Uh, and that's what it was for the last 10 minutes, just one big panic uh, and get the game finished. And it's been like that far too often this year. And for the benefit of our younger viewers, you can catch up with Dad's Army on Dave. Um, so there you are. <laughs> so, so, so simple as that. I knew you'd get it in, Ruffy. Dad's army on the programme. Um, as far as Mother were concerned, um, Mother thought they might have been able to snatch a point. There was a goal line clearance from Diego Laxalt when they thought they were uh, in with a header at the back post, and it was very, very close indeed. And Graham Alexander thought they deserved at least a point. I thought we. we uh... If we'd have got one, we'd have deserved it for our, for our uh, discipline, our, 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 uh, our focus on the game, what we did on the ball in the second half. Certainly, you know, Celtic will say, and rightly so, they had lots of possession and, and they did have opportunities themselves. Um, but I thought for the away team, coming to um, a team that's been fantastic over the last 10 years, um, we pushed them hard. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone would have begrudged us in the end if we'd have got that equaliser because I thought um, the players worked exceptionally hard for it. I, I look at the players they've got, Ali. I don't think Mother will be involved in it. I think they will be able to pull away from it. They've got too many good players. I mean, uh, I'm impressed with Campbell. Um, uh, and again, their fullbacks worked well. Everybody really worked well on Saturday. Um, and I think when you look at the bottom six, they've got more than enough quality to get away from it. Funnily enough, I was at Fir Park last Wednesday night and I thought the same. I think um, Alan Campbell has stood out for me every time I've seen him this season. But I would also say too that I think this is maybe the most consistent I've ever seen Tony Watt. Uh, he didn't score last Wednesday night when I was at the game, but he worked his socks off. He was very industrious. I thought he had a really good attitude. He was he was pressing, he was working back. He was involved in, in so much of the creative play and so much of the attacking work. And I think they have a good work ethic. I think they've also had a lift from Graham Alexander going in too. But I, I fancy that they'll they'll have a positive and, and quite a firm end to the season. Yeah, uh, Campbell, um, I think he could play at a, another level. What that level is, high, uh, above Motherwell, obviously. Uh, Tam, I don't know what you think yourself. Yeah, I think he's a terrific player. Uh, he's also an old Saints boy from Bermullet, the high school that I went to. So he's up from my neck of the woods. So... And supposedly he's, he, you know, he's first in the door at Motherwell and last out. He's a great professional. So I think if he's got that work ethic as a young player and that attitude, along with the ability he's got, you know, he can go and play at a really high level. He's been really impressive for Motherwell, and he's obviously out of contract. I don't think he'll sign a new deal for Motherwell. He'll be away in the summer. But uh, be interesting to see what, what sort of clubs come in for him. Thanks to Chris Andrews, who reckons uh, now that Ruffy's mentioned Dad's Army, he reckons that uh, Tam is Pike uh, from Dad's Army. So <laughs> there you are. There's always there's always something wanting to get leather. Yeah. You're first to guess it, Tam. Um, but uh, <laughs> stupid boy. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, uh, apart from anything else, Tom, you're best placed. Derek McInnes, Aberdeen, under pressure. Yeah, definitely, Peter. I think that they were they were dreadful at the weekend. You know, it's one of the worst Aberdeen performances I've seen in a long time. I thought they were devoid of any sort of creativity. I know Hedges is a big miss for them, but you know they didn't look like scoring. You know, it was a very very comfortable afternoon at the back for 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 Hibs, and uh, you know Hibs deservedly won the game. Two great goals, but. I think he's he's under pressure now, Derek. I think when you see the league table, I think Hibs have obviously got a be five point cushion now. Uh, Aberdeen get the game in hand, but I think he's he's under the cosh up there. I think that a lot of Aberdeen fans would like to see the back of him now, but I think it's up to Derek. You know, he start winning some games. You know, they're on a bad bad run at the minute. They don't look like scoring goals, and they were they were very very poor at the back. So um, I think he's he's un, he's definitely under pressure, Peter. Yeah, one win and eight for the Dons, and I think even Derek McInnes himself is first to admit he can sense a real uh, frustration coming from the Aberdeen fans. Yeah, I can. It's 
we've been used to far better than that. We've offered up far far better than that over the piece, and you know it's uh, it's not a start that we're proud of, and it's disappointing we're on that type of run. But um, we we work hard to try and address that. Yeah, um, just when you think about the pressure, the the players seem to be still behind him. Here's Johnny Hayes. The manager's always going to be the one, unfortunately, to, to carry the faults for his players. Um, we know as a player group, we've had the talks about we've not been good enough, simple as. Um, as I said, going out the mistakes and, and looking back over games, it, it, I, I think players have to bear the responsibility, myself included, everybody. I think you, you, you can't just say, oh, it's the manager, anything about the manager. I think for me, I've, I've been in the game long enough to know that as a team, we're not performing well enough. And when it's not going right for you, Ruffy, I, I don't know about you, but I thought the Hibs penalty was very, very soft indeed. I mean, that gave them the perfect platform to go and build. Yeah, and I think Derek said, I think we all know in these games, the first goal is always important. Uh, I actually thought he'd lost control of the ball. I thought he'd hit the ball at the park before the collision. I don't know where the rules stand uh, on that one. He definitely did take him out, but I, I thought there was no chance of a, a goal coming out of the anything that he'd done because the ball was out of the park. So it's a tough one for him to take uh, because when you're going through a bad run like that, you, you, you don't want to be going going behind against your, your nearest rivals. But uh, to get back to the Derek one, I, I, I think Derek comes into the same case as Neil Lennon. If it is going to happen, it should be at the end of the season. For He's been at the club now for eight years uh, and he's done a lot of good things in that eight years. So that, that's I, that's what I think he should be judged mm -hmm. on, not, not one particular bad run. Uh, and I think basically that's the, the thing that will go against them. If there is going to be a change, they might think he's been there too long. Uh, and that's that's a terrible thing, you know, that he's been good enough to be there eight years and eight years is too long. There's some people say, oh, you need a change, you need a new face. And it'd be a shame for that. That would be the reason that they would move him on. Well, Hibs have got that five-point advantage, but it's not significant according to Jack Ross. To win the game today and add to our points total is important. I said not season defining, only be significant if we finish where we are at the end of the season. But I think, you know, for us having like won four out of five now, I think the players are, the, you can feel it sometimes within a group. And I feel now as if that, that energy is back amongst them, that kind of drive to make sure that they finish in the position they're in at the moment. Hibs third or Aberdeen third, Ali? Hibs for me. On, on recent evidence, I think I would be going for Hibs. Yeah, no point in asking you, Tam, because um, uh, if you said Aberdeen, then obviously they could cut you from Hibs Television for the last maybe six <laughs> or seven shows of the season. So, so I'll not bother asking you um, because I know where you think. Ruffy, uh, is there any point in asking you as well? I mean, I no. think Hibs, I'm in Ali's no. camp. You going Hibs? Yeah, I'm going Hibs as well. Just, just remind me now, there was an interesting point uh, on the telly there that third place gets European football. Do we not always have four teams in European football? Whether yeah, well, it's Europa point? Cup. Well, I, I thought it was only been three. Oh, I thought we were only getting three teams this year. No, they were saying no. that's why it's important for Aberdeen to be third. So if Aberdeen finished fourth, do they not get into Europe? Well, I think I think you've got to look at the Scottish Cup and whether the Scottish Cup is finished or not. I mean, there's a big debate at the moment over the Scottish Cup. So. Um, You'll so have to wait and see, to, It gets preference to fourth place. Yeah, that'll get into Europa League, unless it was somebody that won the league who also won the Scottish Cup. But I don't think Celtic are going to do that this season. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, Livingston against St. Johnson, talking about Cups, Tam. Um, is, do you read anything into it? Can you read anything into it with St. Johnson getting the win over Livy? And finally, uh, you know, with David Martindale getting manager of the month, Suddenly, when you usually get manager of the month, Tam, it usually all comes crumbling mm. down afterwards. Yeah, the curse of the manager of the month. Yeah, no, I think the St. Johnson will get a lot of confidence from that, winning that game. Uh, going into the cup final, I think it's a totally different game, but it's a final. You know, you're at Hamden, you're on grass. It's a bigger pitch, you know, so I think it's... Uh, St. Johnson will take confidence from a massive win. We've all been raving about Livingston. You know, the run they've been on, but for St. Johnson to go there and win the game, I think it's a great result for them. And, and St. Johnson, I think, have been a good, a, a good side. They've been good this season. They've been looking to try and push into the top six as well. So I don't think it'll have any massive significance, but 
I think that uh, in the back of their mind, St Johnston will know they're capable of beating Livingston, and I think that's that's always a key ingredient when you're going to play somebody, you know you're capable of beating them. Yeah, strangely enough, I still fancy, I don't know, I mean, listen, things can change, it could all collapse before we get to the end of February, Alison, but I still fancy Livingston to win it if I was, if I was going to put a bet on between everybody on the show. I have to say I'm not sure how I would call it at the minute. I watched the, the highlights of the game and I thought St Johnson played very well and you just wonder it'll be the teams will be very, very similar when they meet at Hamden. You just wonder if if they've come up with a way to, to negate Livingston and, and to work out how to get the better of them or not. I think as a barometer for what's to come in the final, I'm not sure you can read too much into it other than the fact that you take a, a great deal of confidence from it and you end that bit of momentum that Livingston have had that wee bit of confidence that they've built up. But uh, at the minute, I, I think, I, I don't know if I could call it between the two teams. Yeah, I'll tell you a team that did need a win, Tam, Dundee United. Mm. I mean, I don't think I don't think any of us called it, and um, forgive me, Ruffy, if, I, if you did call it, but I don't think any of us predicted Dundee United to win on Saturday, did we? No, I stupidly Ruffy. went, I stupidly went I for Ross <laughs> County for the first time this year. <laughs> was I don't the first <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, no, I, I think uh, that game could have went either way. If you saw the game uh, before that a goal was scored, you know that uh, both teams had chances uh, to go ahead. Uh, obviously, Shankland did a couple round the round the keeper, and his confidence must have been a wee bit low before he actually he got the goal. But uh, no, I think in the end of the day, I think uh, Dundee United deserved that one. Yeah, great bit of counter-attacking play, uh, to be perfectly honest with Yali, to get Dundee United the goal. Mm, I agree with Duffy. I just think uh, Shankland has looked really bereft of confidence in really weeks uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and you just wonder how uh, if this result might give them a, a wee bit of a lift and a wee bit of a push. But as I said, I watched them against Motherwell last week and I thought they looked like a team in trouble. I, I really did. I thought that you could see them being sucked down into that relegation fight and it's now just a question of whether or not you can sustain that wee bit of momentum but their whole problem over the course of this season has been inconsistency so you, you really need to you can't afford now to, to to let it slide you need to be able to build in that performance and building the points because I think uh, just from what I've seen the, the games that I've seen from the United this season I, I just think that they could definitely find themselves down at the lower end come the, the business end of the season. Yeah, Niall says, I said 2-1 to Dundee United on Friday, Pedro. So what are you talking about? Niall, you're absolutely right. There are some people who did predict Dundee United, but certainly didn't get any uh, real backing on this programme. We hold our hands up. We got it wrong. It uh, wasn't too many points going about in the predictor. We'll get to that shortly. A really bad weekend for Ruffy. Um, but other than that, <laughs> um, Tam and myself just plodding away, just constantly just racking up some points much to the annoyance of the big man it could be that we get to lockdown uh, it comes out of lockdown just in time to go for a lovely slap up meal time let's hope that is the case yes. um uh, submitting against kelly um kelly managerless at that time but you can't take anything away from submitting because tam they're looking good i mean what a what a good season this is for jim goodwin yes yeah, submitting are, are excellent peter i think that We've got a great blend in the team. Um, Abika looks sharp now. You know, he looks as if he's in top form. And uh, I think we all kind of predicted St. Martin to win that game. Come on, that need a manager. And obviously they've got that in Tommy Wright. And I think they needed one desperately. They were they were in real trouble. But I think Tommy Wright will be the man just to steady the ship. But St. Martin, you know, trying to go for that top six. And, you know, and some people did predict them to finish in the top six this season, St. Martin. So hopefully they can do that. Yeah, I wonder who that. I wonder who some people are. Uh, there you go again. He, he does it, Ali. He just does it. Then he thinks we don't notice. He always mentions these positives and then keeps quiet when he's had an absolute stinker or a howl or a, a statement. You know. To be fair, I thought he was referencing Tony Fitzpatrick because when I heard those comments away in the summer, I thought he was putting on a, a tremendous amount of pressure on, on Jim Goodwin. At the time, I thought, gosh, that's quite a a fair weight of expectation to put on him, but it, it looks it looks a possibility. It looks plausible, given the, the recent results. Forgive me for this, Ruffy, and, and, and I, I am open to criticism from many people who uh, post messages on our social uh, media, uh, but am I oversimplifying the way I think football should be played? If I look back at the history books and any team 
that's built on a solid foundation. And I look at Clough, I look at Shankly, Paisley, Steen, Sir Matt Busby, Sir Alex Ferguson. Good goalkeeper, two good centre halves. Obviously, you're going to look for the midfield, um, but wingers. Wingers. I mean, I love wingers. Wingers bring you goals, open up defences, <laughs> and you can win games with them. And the reason I mention that is because Dermis, Ilkay Dermis, who played well against Celtic, put a ball in for St Mirren at the weekend, which was an absolute peach to get them a goal. It's not exactly rocket science. Celtic have suffered without Forrest, but wingers are, a, are a, for me, the way I would, I would have two wingers on any side I was putting together, Ruffy. Well, it's, it's one of the reasons why centre-forwards go into Barden spells. It's one of the reasons why if they've not got balls coming into the box, good deliveries, then they're not going to score goals, and that, that's when they start to suffer. I think we'll all agree that uh, the, the best person for that for me was John Robertson. I think you just have to look at the ball he put over in the European Cup final. Uh, it was I don't think he had to break stride before he uh, put it in the back of the net. But yeah, yeah ask a centre forward uh, if the winger's not playing particularly well and there's no service coming in the box because he's the one that's going to suffer. Uh, and I think we all like to see wingers. I mean, it's a dying breed now. I, I, I can't even remember. The last time I saw a winger getting taken on two or three defenders and going by them and then whipping a the ball in. So, no, it's, it's, it's moved on dramatically now and there's not, not many of these Ryan gigs going about. Yeah, I always remember Derek Johnson used to say to me when I worked with him, Tom, he said, he, he, a barrel load, and remember, Derek was some post-war goal scorer for Rangers. Had he, had he not played at centre-half and in midfield um, for a, a good section of his career for Rangers, I think he would have... Uh, you know, giving Ali McCoy a run for his money in the goal stakes, but he always said, you know, a barrel load of his goals were down to Tommy McLean. Tommy McLean knew exactly what Derek was all about and could just float a ball or whip a ball in, and there he was, Derek, your classic centre forward, bang, it's in the back of the net. Yeah, definitely. I think that any striker you rely on service. You know, unless you're Lino Messi, you can do it yourself. But you know, if you're a striker, you're you're in there. You want crosses in the box, as Ruffy says, you want. As soon as if the winger or the wide man goes by the fullback, you're starting to make your run. You know, you need quality balls in, you know, whipped low and hard across the goal. Or if you're a big target man, maybe hung up to the back post, you can peel off onto a, onto a fullback. So, yeah, it's really important uh, as a striker that you're getting that service. And, and it's, there's, there's no greater sight, you know, as Ruffy said, Ryan Giggs there. You know, you look at that great Man United team, likes of him and, and Beckham out wide. You know, Beckham, they were slightly different. Beckham was would get the ball out of his feet and just whip it in straight away. And Giggs would run at people and and terrorise full-backs and then put balls across the box. So, and that's not, that's no, you know, guys like Dwight York and, and Andy Cole scored a lot of goals because of those two two guys putting the balls in. So, it's important that you've got good service and good wide men in any team. Yeah, absolutely. And just in case you think you're the only one getting absolutely cane, Tom, uh, Neil Jameson has said, that's why you're not a manager, Peter. Football has totally changed. Man City don't even play with a striker now. Um, yeah, it's a good point you make, Neil. Listen, each to their own. If you like your football without wingers, fine and dandy. Um, and you make a very good point again about uh, Manchester City, uh, a team who've spent over a billion pounds and still haven't won the Champions League. Just thought I'd add that in. Um, anyway, apart from anything else, I I take your your kick where the sun don't shine. <laughs> don't mind. Um, I like wingers. Simple as that. Uh, apart from anything else, what about the Premiership table? Do we change our mind week by week? We see the look of this table. Uh, Rangers um, out in front with a tremendous goal difference as well over uh, Celtic, which is easily worth a point. Not that it will have any bearing on the, the top end. There's uh, Hibbs with an advantage at the bottom end. Um, Hamilton, Ross County, Kilmarnock and Motherwell. You could basically throw a blanket over them. Uh, I think it's four of them in that mix, unless you're going to tell me differently, Ali. No, I'd, I'd agree with you, I think the, the bottom four, possibly the bottom three, I think Motherwell have had a wee adrenaline shot since Graham Alexander went in. But I think you only really need a, a poor run, a, a few poor results, see, even from St Johnson and Dundee United, and I think you, you find yourself firmly sucked back down into it. I had a feeling I lost Ali there. You were talking about it. Do you agree with me? 
Yeah, I was just saying, I think, um, you know, all you need is a sequence of fairly poor results, either a couple of draws or a few defeats, and you can find yourself really getting either sucked back into that fight or else there, there's a danger too for the likes of Hamilton or Ross County where you become marooned at the bottom if you lose a couple of games. I think uh, now when we go into the latter stages, it, it gets so important just to eke out points anywhere in, in any way that you can. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we always like to have a laugh um, uh, and dissect and discuss Gabriel's team of the week to see if we agree with it or not, because he's got a really good strike rate on uh, you know selecting eleven players that most weeks we agree with. Sometimes he goes through a little spell where we get a chance to cane him for one or two. Uh, let's have a look at this week's selection. Alan McGregor made more saves on Sunday than in any other game or campaign. Liam Smith was a threat down the right for United, getting an assist. Jamie Hamilton is only 18 and has a massive future, but he defended well beyond his years against Rangers. Stephen Welsh got his first Celtic goal and is one of the few bright lights of their season. Greg Taylor had one of his strongest performances of the year, creating chances from the left. Scott Tanzer killed in a beautiful free kick that left the Livy keeper motionless. Jamie Murphy created plenty from his free roaming role and won another penalty for Hibbs. Ilkay Dermis has come onto a game lately and created the Saints opener. Martin Boyle scored twice for Hibs and has taken over Nisbet's mantle as their main man. Lawrence Shanklin was back amongst the goals and was United's best player. Bruce Anderson was impressive against Rangers all game and he was close to a goal for himself. Well, there you are, if I hadn't been for Alan McGregor, um, I think Gabriel's Twitter feed might have been getting absolute pelters, Ruffy, um, because there was a distinct lack of outfield Rangers players there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Alan, Alan McGregor deserved to be in there. I thought the boy Kelly was absolutely outstanding as well. Uh, Celtic, he made some terrific saves. Uh, the only one I would have probably in would probably be Abika. Uh, and I thrown in, I thought he did well for St Mirren at the weekend. Okay, um, let's have a look at the old predictor. Um, Ali, you've probably looked at it from afar and wondered as it goes from one extreme to the other. Earlier on in the season, there was a real arrogance about um, Blofeld, sidekick McManus. Um, but as you can see, uh, from being way, way out in front, he's now in second position. Uh, and I've got 2-3-2. Two, two. Tam, you're on 2-2-8. Two, two, and I think, Tam, at this point, um, with Ruffy on 2-1-7, I think there's a. I think you and I could maybe have a kind of a confident strut all the way to the end of the season because I can't see the big man. I can't see the big man narrow that gap enough not to be buying us a meal this season. No, it's a straight fight now. I think that Ruffy's, you know, he's blue's load. He's out. He's out of the picture. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> maybe I should rephrase maybe. that. Well, I'm just about to say he, maybe he's he's blown it. Yeah, maybe he's blown yeah. it. Ruffy, Ruffy, it doesn't look good for you, son. You're, you're no, but as you, as you know, two correct scores just bring you back into the game. You used to have been lucky. You've been getting a couple of correct scores here and there. I haven't managed to, to muster that yet. But no, there's a long, long yeah. way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Alison, as you look on as an outsider on this situation, I think you would accept Tam and I uh, and our point of view on this. Ruffy's, Ruffy's doomed. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> and, uh, I'm uh, just wondering uh, whether or not your bottle will hold, Peter. Oh, well, I'll hold the bottle of red and then I'll pass it over to Tam. <laughs> and, then, and, then we'll move, and then we'll move on to our main course, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, but uh, at long, I can't wait for us to actually get out. It's, uh, I'm going stir crazy. Um, anyway, but I should have actually done that, Tam. I really, for the first time last night, I felt envious of you um, because I did say to um, my wife and daughter, hey, you know, let's all get the get the snacks and get the, the drinks out and we'll watch the Super Bowl. And the two of them looked at me as if I was a complete uh, rocket, um, as if to say, Dad, don't know be you silly. Either. There's no danger. And there's you sitting with your wife and you've, you're having a, a shot for every touchdown in the Super Bowl. It would have been magic, Tam, but uh, it's just not happening. I just sat there like a, a complete loser last night till half three in the morning, Ruffy, watching American football. Yeah, and he wouldn't have been quite sober at the end of it as well, waiting to have that shot because they were very yeah. few and far between. <laughs> uh, have, have, <laughs> having lived in America for a year at uh, Orlando and 
seen a lot of these games. Uh, I've decided, as I said earlier, to watch the highlights because the live stuff, there's too many stoppages and too many things happen. I remember the first time I went and there was a player passage and I didn't know who ended up with the ball. I hadn't a yeah. clue who had the ball, you know, and it, it just happens so quick uh, that you don't know what's happened. But when you see it in the telly, you can get the replay and, and all that. But, I mean, the boy Brady, absolutely. It's phenomenal. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal, you know, to oh. and you get a ring, don't you, for every game, every one you win. Yeah. Yeah. yeah super Seven Bowl rings. Ring. Oh, Seven rings now, Ruffy. It's amazing. Uh, I must admit, though, Ali, I was looking at our uh, press in the uh, Celtic game at the weekend, and I don't think most of our uh, members of the written press and broadcast would fancy four hours of football and then maybe a rewrite just at the last minute. I don't think there'd be too many of them happy with that kind of covering sport, Ali. Well, certainly not in this climate when uh, when we can't get inside anywhere. I think um, some of us have been in real danger of hypothermia this season, sitting outside before games and then no way that half time and doing your quotes post match round at the track while you're shivering away. So no, I certainly don't think a, a four hour game would be enticing to any of us. Uh, but the the rewrites at the last minute for for any sport it, it is not to be envied. It's, it can only be described as life shortening when you're on deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you're right, Ali. And the worst one I ever remember somebody said to me when I was covering the golf one day, Tam. Oh, this is magic! You get to cover all sorts of sports. And I can remember covering uh, the Open at Muirfield. I think I managed to see one guy hit the ball off the tee in the whole four days. And it was one of those ones where uh, John Daly forced um, a playoff on the fourth day, which meant we were all going to be sitting, editing and writing till about half 11 at night. I think I must have been about the last one out of the tent. And it's a, it was a nightmare. <laughs> one one hit of the golf ball is all I saw. Yeah, in the, Peter, in the open. Peter. I was going to yeah, say, I imagine... remember Peter again, again, invited to the Trun Open by tenants in their hospitality tent. I never seen a player. I <laughs> <laughs> saw <So> anybody. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, it's a good point. Actually, it's a good point, Rocky. I did take my father-in-law one day uh, to Loch Lomond to the golf, and, and I think I carried him into the car. Um, it's a great day out, Tom, isn't it? Yeah, I, I went to the PGA Championships when I was playing for Rochester uh, over in America. Uh, the PGA was in Rochester, which was brilliant that that season. Jason Duffner won it, and uh, I can remember similar to Ruffy. I couldn't see it. It was like 10, 12 deep. You couldn't see a thing. And I just I just sacked it off and went to, went to the beer tent. And, and much like yourself, I get pulled into a, into a taxi later on that night. But, but we're, talk, we're, talking about, we're talking about rewrites. Can you imagine um, the, the Bayern Munich Man United game in the Champions League? Oh. The two goals in the ball. That must have been... Oh. Two goals in Absolutely. the last minute. And of course, the other thing about it is I can imagine it from a German perspective, where the German journalist is clearly writing, Bayern Munich have dominated the game, they've hit the bar, <laughs> they should have won by more than the solitary goal. And of course, uh, they were that good that they took Lothar Matthias off before the end of the game. Uh, you know, he's probably written it in such a way that it's uh, the coronation of Bayern Munich and then suddenly up pops Ole Gunnar Solskjaer uh, and Teddy Sheringham. Um, interestingly enough, with that in mind, uh, it looks as if it's all done and dusted uh, down south, guys. Um, Liverpool, I mean, honestly, see your goalkeepers, Ruffy. You do my head in. I mean, what is he doing, Alisson? What's Alisson doing? Just clear the ball into the stand. Suddenly, you know, this whole thing of let's keep playing football in our own penalty box. Keep passing the ball, keep passing the ball. Yeah. I think this philosophy of always having your goalkeeper play it out it, it, it's nice at times but I think also there are there are moments in games where it just comes down to a more fundamental element of clear your lines and and why by whatever means necessary yeah just out of curiosity Rafi when I mentioned Alison there you were aware I was talking about the Liverpool goalkeeper <laughs> and not Alison <laughs> which is why you paused is that right is that right no, I thought Rafi? you were, I thought you were asking I, no I thought you were asking Alison <laughs> Uh, no, no, I was telling yeah, you, Alison about I was Alison. talking about your, I was talking about your dumpling goalkeepers. He cost Liverpool the game. Well, blame the manager because that's what they want the goalkeepers to do. Uh, uh, they want them to pass out for the back. I don't know who was it started. Who was it started that? What manager was it? Come over and started passing out for the back. 
Can't remember who it was. Anyway, it became a thing. It became something you had to be good at, and then all the goalkeepers had to change and be good with the ball at their feet and good. And it is good when you see it. Uh, and and unfortunately for him, he's the best at it, Alison. He is that. He is absolutely unbelievable. But you're going to get caught. You know, you're not that good with the ball at your feet. A good striker is going to catch you or put you under pressure. But uh, for me, it's whoever decided to do it is their fault. But you're right that you're a goalkeeper to keep the ball out of the net, not, not to be playing fancy footwork. Yeah, Ali, it's all over down south. Do you agree? Yes. I thought Liverpool had to win yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, one really shining light in it all, and I think it's good news for England, um, the boy Phil Foden looks an absolute player and Pep Guardiola is raving about him. Right now he's moving perfectly <coughs> in the sides as a winger. And of course, the second and four goal were outstanding, phenomenal, and uh, because the quality is there. But we cannot forget, he's just 20, 21 years old, have an incredible huge margin to improve. And I know he's a guy who is so calm, he's so... Um, uh, he, he stay in the position he has to stay he want to learn he loves to play football I'm pretty sure he will improve I like him Tam do you? yeah I think he's top class you know I, I've liked him for a long time you know I've been looking for him to get a rerun that Man City team obviously you look at the guys that's, that's in that squad I think obviously David Silva uh, leaving uh, in the summer there I think was massive for him because he plays in a similar position to Foden so I think when Silva left it, it opened up a wee opportunity for Foden to get a run in the team, and I think he's different class. You know, you see the way he moves. He's so calm on the ball. You know, I think it was the second goal. It was a poor pass back for the goalkeeper. Uh, pass out, sorry, and he dribbled to the, the byline and, and picked a pass out. You know, it's not easy to do that. You know, sometimes you get in that position and you you maybe lash it or you, you panic a little bit. But he was so so confident, so calm, just to roll it across the goal for somebody to print the net. Uh, I think he's top drawer, and I think that England have got so many good young players coming through. You know, Gaelish as well. And he put that put him in the mix. So. The future is really, really promising for, for England national team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just before we go, I always like to read out, um, you know, lots of intelligent fans who, who cover the show um, and, and watch us every week and join the football family. They love their team. They're very passionate. And then every now and then, I, I always like to, as Tam, the smile comes over Tam's face when I'm leathering uh, a few people um, for their abuse or their downright bad taste when they're putting things across. But I, I thought I'd read out Scott Hughes's post just to re let you get an insight into the mentality of Scott who says, uh, Phil Foden is a Rangers fan. Are you raging, Peter? Um, now, <laughs> I'm not quite <laughs> sure. I'm not quite sure if Scott is a Phil Schilling. My wife's a Rangers fan, and I'm still not raging. Uh, I mean, you need, to get, you need to get a grip. So is mine. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, absolutely. Can't um, be fair, mate. So, ah, this is it, Tom, you know. Um, listen, it's a game of football. It's only a game. Uh, it shouldn't dominate your life. Uh, anyway, Scott, thanks for your thanks for your comment there. Just uh, made me laugh. Um, apart from anything else, there are three games in the midweek that um, I think are tasty. Tommy Wright will be um, buzzing Ruffy to get going. Kilmarnock against Motherwell on Wednesday. Yeah, it'd be, he'd love to start with a win. You know, that would be his main thing. He'll get in there. He'll get to know the players uh, a wee bit. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what kind of style of football he, he wants to play. I had a couple of training sessions with them, but they need a win and he needs a win. You know, he, he, he's he he's been down there with St. Johnson on, on numerous occasions and numerous occasions he's been ma managed to get them out yet. Uh, sometimes he's been down there a long, long time and all of a sudden, the end of the season, he's top six. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he's probably got the job. So, yeah, a, a good early win for him would be a good start. Yeah, absolutely. Livingston against Hamilton. Aki's not uh, not one for the football purists in midweek. It'll be one of those scraps. It'll be a battle. Hamilton. Oh, plastico. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's one of those ones where Hamilton will fight tooth and nail uh, to try and get the great escape as well. I, I did actually, I did actually see a fantastic um, picture which had uh, the Steve McQueen's motorbike from the Great Escape with Brian Rice's head superimposed on it, and they've been doing that for years. Tam, I wouldn't rule it out. No, I, I think they, they they always surprise you. They always <laughs> come back near the end. I thought. Before the Rangers game, I thought if they get beat today, they could be start to get marooned a little bit. But great performance yesterday and a, and, a, and a massive point. So you wouldn't put it past them, you know, getting out getting out of the trouble again. But I still think they'll get relegated this season, Aki's. 
Yeah, okay, he's sticking by it. And the one game that I can't call, because I don't know which way it's going to go, Alison, is St Mirren against Celtic, because the Saints are flying. I mean, this is this is on St Mirren's home turf. Could be a right good game. I think that'll be a very, very difficult game for Celtic on Wednesday night. Uh, I think Celtic toil at times, playing on the, the artificial surfaces too. Uh, I think St Mirren are, are full of confidence. They've already beaten Celtic a couple of weeks back. Uh, they'll have nothing to fear. They'll, they'll go in. I think it'll be a, a sticky, sticky game. Uh, and I, I don't think there'll be a, a huge amount of goals in it. And I think I'll leave the last word to Alec Kelly, who's a big Rangers fan uh, and always uh, posts the odd uh, good bit of banter on the programme. And he's basically said, I think it's quite clear that in your house, Peter, and in McManus's house, the ladies have the brains. What more can I say than that, Tom? We can't argue with it or <laughs> the dinner will, or the dinner will be over the top of my head. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Uh, anyway, apart from anything else, um, thank you very much. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook. Don't forget to like uh, and share the stream if you get a chance. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. But from Ruffy, Alison, Tom and myself, Peter Martin, thanks for watching. Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit